um, a lot of people are are sorrowful. A lot of people are going through pain. Uh, I can pretty much guess here that uh, someone in this room at least is going through some sort of pain or some sort of sorrow over some situation, whether it's marital struggles or whether it's with children. Uh, I just uh, read something about a, a prayer request for uh, for a family that, that just needs uh, some wisdom in dealing with uh, their nine-year-old daughter who's just really, really rebellious right now. And they're looking to possibly take her to some sort of boot camp. Nine years old. Nine years old. That, that's crazy. I can understand 14 and 15 and 16-year-olds, but nine? Uh, that's that's tough. Um, that's some rebelliousness that's taking place there. I get periodically calls in the middle of the night from an individual that has been calling me for the last two years, and he's a little uh, bipolar. And he'll call me in the middle of the night, and usually he always starts off with, oh, I didn't think I'd get anybody, you know, because it's you know 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. And I have my phone right next to me, so I answer all the calls. It's, it's I'm on call 24/7, and so I'll I'll just listen to him. And he's having all of these thoughts. People are looking at him. He can't go to sleep. He's struggling. These thoughts and you know things that he's just dwelling upon and just really focusing on. And so it just really affects him. He gets depressed. And and so usually I listen to him. I, I really don't have any answers for him, but Jesus and he knows the Lord, and he just wants prayer. That's really what he wants is prayer. And so I'll end up praying with him and then, you know, letting him go. There are a lot of people that are hurting. A lot of people that are hurting. And hurting for various reasons. You know, hurting because we live in a world that, that's just very hurtful. Uh, it's a fallen world and things happen. I think of the man that was blind and the disciples couldn't understand why he was blind. And Jesus said, it's for the glory of God. No other reason. Not mother or father didn't sin. It's for the glory of God that God would be glorified through it. And oftentimes we go through pain and suffering and sorrow because God is going to be glorified through it somehow. Other times it's our fault. It's the choices we make. You know, the, the old um, you reap what you sow type of thing. And that reaping can go on for a long time because of the choices we've made. But the fact is, is that we go through sorrows and coming to Christ doesn't necessarily mean that your sorrows are over. Uh, I, I wish that did. In my naiveness, when I first got saved, I thought life was going to be a lot better and it has been, but I literally thought I'd have no more pain, no more suffering, that, that everything would actually go good all the time. Uh, that's how excited I was about God and, and, and believed how powerful he was. And then I realized that wasn't the truth. You know, we, we have to grow, and sometimes the pain and suffering that we go through helps us to, to grow and to mature into the Christians that God wants us to be. And so, a lot of sorrow, and we need to understand that God sees that sorrow, right? And you threw the out the... the Bible, we see oftentimes God looking down upon his people and he sees the pains of the people. He sees the, the blood crying out to him because of the wickedness that's taking place uh, upon his children. And God sees those things and he understands them and knows them above anyone else. He knows our sorrows. He knows our pains. And so, like Peter says, cast your cares on him because he, he cares for you. you know, First Peter tells us that. And so casting them on him, sometimes that's our only hope, that's our only strength to know that he has them in the span of his hand and that he will take care of those things. So as we look at this uh, book here, uh, we will see definitely how God sees uh, us through his eyes, very sorrowful, but yet he has hope. He has hope that his work will be complete in us. So let me give you a little quick overview of Lamentations. It's a little book, not very big, five chapters. And so you can probably read it within a, seat, a, a sitting. In the Greek, it's called Lamentations in the Latin English version. Uh, the word Lamentations actually means in the dictionary the act of lamenting or expressing some sort of grief. Expressing some sort of grief. I, I'm grieved every time I think about the children in Iraq. I, I'm totally grieved. And I hope you're grieved too. I, I hope it's touching your heart. Um, if it's not, then something's 
definitely wrong with the United States. Obviously, it's not touching uh, our government's heart enough that they're doing something about it. I mean, we're supposed to be a Christian nation, and these are Christians over there being persecuted. You know, that alone should should cause us to do something about it. And then all they're doing is playing the political game. Well, I didn't pull the troops out of Iraq. It really wasn't my choice, you know, is, is, is the answer now. It was someone else's choice, you know, and, and so forth. And they're just playing the political game while people are dying and children are being beheaded. And that's sad. There's really no grief. It hasn't really hit the heart. Uh, the Jews uh, refer to this book uh, from the first word in chapters 1, 2, and 4 uh, as how, or at last. And so you, you kind of get the idea of the sorrow and the pain that they're going through. Like, how, Lord, is this happening? And, and ah, do something at last with this whole situation that they're going through. Uh, five separate poems. This is a prophetic book, a poetic book, uh, written at, like the Psalms. And it uh, has a basic theme that uh, deals with Jerusalem's destruction by Nebuchadnezzar uh, around 586 B.C., and so the idea of them being uh, taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, them losing the temple, being destroyed, their family members being separated, uh, kind of like what happened with uh, Germany, se- segregating the, the Jews and separating them from their families and so forth, and children going to one camp, husbands to another, women on another camp, and this type of thing. Uh, same thing took place in, in uh, the whole Babylonian captivity. You have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three young men. You don't hear about their their family, their parents, and yet they were possibly uh, protégés within the temple being ready to be priests. And they were taken, and they were taken into the palace there in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. And God used them in a mighty way through it all. And then you have Daniel also, who they believe was was a prophet, or is a prophet, and was a priest in the temple himself. Again, separated from his family, uh, taken into captivity, having no possessions and so forth, and no identity in a, in a sense there in a foreign land. And so you can imagine the struggles uh, that took place during that time as they saw their family members being killed and destroyed and their houses burned and, and so forth. So the book passionately expresses a heartfelt sorrow for the people. <clears throat> I remember uh, the first time as a young pastor officiating over my first marriage. It was very scary, first of all. Uh, I went through counseling with this with this young couple that that just were adamant about about being wed. She was more of a Christian than he was, though he he acted like one and really put on a very good act on being a Christian and how much he loved them. They went through the whole counseling and passed with flying colors and so forth. There was one struggle, and that struggle was that he had a tendency to go out with his friends a lot, and he would leave her quite often uh, alone. And she was really concerned about that. And so we talked at length about, about that, that once you're married, you know, you're to cleave to your wife. She is to be your priority and so forth. And he understood all those things and, and said, yeah, that's not going to be an issue. And, and so they were married and probably within two weeks she came in and she was just devastated because he went back to his old life. He was just always out with his friends. He was never home. You know, it devastated her. Uh, it devastated me because I started to look at myself like, what did I do? I should have saw this. I never should have married them. You know, I, I, I could have stopped it. I could have maybe focused on it, you know, postponed it. And I just really questioned myself as to why I didn't um, do something better. But she was devastated through it all. Um, it didn't stop me from marrying other people, though. I just continued on and hoped that God will somehow work these things out. So Lamentations is about God's sorrow. Who wrote this book? Well, many believe uh, that Jeremiah wrote it, and that's why we as believers uh, put the book right after the book of Jeremiah. So in a sense, we're reading the latter part of Jeremiah, and when we're done with Lamentations, we'll go back to Jeremiah and uh, start in chapter 1 and, and read, uh, read the book there in a, in a month or so. And so, um, probably the author, we see this in, in, one of, in the first chapter where it says, he, It came to pass after Israel was led into captivity and Jerusalem laid waste that Jeremiah sat weeping. Uh, 
and lamenting with his limitations over Jerusalem. And so we see him weeping, and this is why we call him the weeping prophet. You may have heard that before. And he's weeping over uh, Jerusalem there, uh, kind of a picture of uh, Jesus himself who weeped over Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 35.25, Jeremiah also lamented for Josiah. To this day, all the singing men and the singing women speak of Josiah in their lamentations. And so again, we see the picture of Jeremiah lamenting. And so um, the per- reason for him being the author. Background and theme, we talked a little bit about it. The fall of Jerusalem was a time of terrible suffering anguish. It was, uh, it was this cast- cast- catastrophe that brought forth the book of lamentation from the heart of Jeremiah. And in a sense, it's an appendix to um, Jeremiah and his prophecies in the book of Jeremiah. Now we come to chapter 1, and we see the desolation of Jerusalem in verses 1 through 11. Now we're going to read through this rather quickly, and I'm going to comment on a f- just a few things that, um, that I have seen and some commentaries have brought out, and Pastor Chuck has brought out, and so forth. Um, our purpose on Wednesday nights is to to get through these chapters, two, three, four at a time if we can, to get us through the Bible, and so not necessarily to really get deeply into it and expound on verse each verse and so forth, So, but to get an idea of what it's all about. So we have an idea what limitation is about, and so again, it, it is a psalm, and and it just flows so easily as we read it. So he says, how uh, lonely sits the city that was full of people. Now speaking of Jerusalem, right? Uh, Now it's not full of people because it's been destroyed. You you go up to the steps and the stones are all turned over and and broken and so forth. Uh, How like a, a widow is she who was great among the nations and the princess among the province has become a slave. And so the captivity that took place when Babylon went in there, she weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. Speaking of idolatry, of of all her idolatry, of of the fact that she worshipped other idols and, and were like other nations, yet none of them came to the rescue. None of them could even help help them just like with us today you know our covetousness which is idolatry Paul uh, tells us you know can really not help us you know you can be a a person that idolizes your your car and your car really can't help you you know through life you know it may get you to work back and forth but eventually it's going to break down if if you don't maintain it you know eventually in age it's going to break down um, because it's just a car, it's, it has no life in it, it can't breathe, it can't think like God, and so forth. And we put so much weight and, and importance in things other than God, and that shouldn't be the case. The Bible's clear that we need to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and then everything else falls into place, right? That's what the Bible says. Why? Because God is honored and respected and, and glorified in our lives. He's put first in, in, in place. And so then God takes care of everything else. He promises that to us. And some don't understand that. And so they become slaves. Uh, she weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. And all her friends have dealt treacherously with her and they have become her enemies. Judah has gone into captivity under affliction and hard servitude. She dwells among the nations. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtake her in dryer strait. The roads to Zion mourn because no one comes to the set feast. So again, Jerusalem being empty, no one uh, keeping the feast anymore uh, there in Jerusalem. That, That is sad. Can you... Can you imagine here in the United States if if they decide that we don't need church anymore? That buildings are now uh, vacant, like in Europe. A lot of churches are vacant. They're huge buildings, beautiful buildings with stained glass windows, and a lot of them sit vacant because there's no need for church anymore. And we're headed that way, believe me or not. It's interesting because at the pastor's conference, I was speaking with somebody And it was a younger person, and they were talking about technology. They were talking about uh, um, keeping up with the times and reaching this new generation because this new generation doesn't want to go to church. 
It doesn't want to go to church. And so we need to take church to them somehow uh, through live streaming, you know, through uh, YouTube, uh, through other means, whatever it is, so that we can reach them uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I think that's sad personally. I think that that we're doing a disservice to what God has designed in church and having church and people fellowshipping one with another, as Hebrews tells us, and not forsaking that, that we would try to go outside and do this through video screen. Um, personally, I think you need to go to church, and church is important. This is where, where we meet together, we're equipped together, we're a part of something in the community, a part of the body of Christ, and you break that up and, and, and there's no more worship and there's no more service to the community. Because everybody's getting ministered into their own homes, you know, but yet how's the community being affected in that way? How's the community seeing the love of God by the love of the brother one for another? You know, they're not seeing those things. And so we're putting less emphasis on the church, and I think that's the ploy of the enemy, wanting to get rid of church. I think church should stand up and start making church a priority. You know, and I think the people in the church should make church a priority and say this is what God established, the Sabbath day, the Sunday, the first day of the week, the Christians met together and they fellowshiped and they also supported that work in that community. Paul went from place to place starting what? Fellowships throughout the various places along with Peter. You know, and the other apostles, we know Thomas went to India, you know, and so forth. So it's important that, that we understand church is important. And we shouldn't make it unimportant and we shouldn't cater to the culture and say, well, let's get out there like the culture and be like them. No, let's get the culture in here. Uh, let's, let's let them understand that the Bible is the word of God and it's powerful. It's not just a, a, a religious faith-based system like everybody else. This is different. Our faith is totally different than, than other religious systems. And so... Um, they're on the roads of Zion, but they mourn because no one comes to sit, sit at their feasts. And all her gates are desolate, her priests sigh, her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. Her adversaries have become the master, her enemies prosper, for the Lord has afflicted her because of the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone into captivity before the enemy, and from the daughter of Zion all her splendor has departed. Her prince have become like deer that find no pasture, that flee without strength before the pursuer. In the days of her affliction and roaming, Jerusalem remembers all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old, when her people fell into the hands of the enemy, with no one to help her. The adversary saw her and mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem has sighed gravely. Therefore she has become vile. All who honor her despise her because they have seen her nakedness. Yes, she sighs and turns away. Her uncleanliness is in her skirt. She did not consider her destiny. Therefore her collapse was awesome. She had no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy is exalted. The adversary has spread his hands over all her pleasant things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you command not to enter your assembly. All her people sigh and seek bread, and they have given their valuables for food to restore life. See, O Lord, and consider, for I am scorned. So, 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 so much pain was brought upon them by their choices because they got into idolatry. They did not believe in their God. They wanted to be like other nations. They began to worship like other nations. They began to take on their idols and put their idols within the temple. Ezekiel tells us that these idols were literally in the temple of God. Can you imagine putting an idol in the temple of God? We can't imagine that. A Jewish person can't imagine that today. They would, they would never want a t a, an idol in the temple of God today if it was built. But back then they had temples and so it was corrupt. It was wicked. They didn't even know who to pray to. And so they prayed to them all just in case. Uh, there were instances when you read in Judges of men carrying little idols with them, putting up little shrines in their homes and various things. And so because of that, they left God. They didn't put God first, and so God gave them over to these idols that really were not powerful into captivity. And so because of their choices, because of the decisions that they made to worship other things, we see that with Christians today. We see Christians who are in the world, and they're not into Christianity. They have a worldview, but not a Christian worldview. 
And so to them, everything looks differently because they're not viewing it through the lens of the scriptures. They're viewing it through the lens of their friends, through the lens of who, what they've been told, what they've been taught in school, and all these other things, instead of through the lens of the scriptures. And that's why it's so important to read the Bible, to study the Bible. I know several here have been going through Chuck's tapes and they just put them on your iPhone, a little iPad, and you just listen to it all. You can go through five, six chapters at a time. That's a good way of getting the word in. Instead of listening to some of these secular music, you know, turn on K-Wave 107.9. Listen to these guys teach all day long. This is how you feed yourself. This is how you grow. This is how you know. You, you get, a, you get a, a Christian worldview. You get a different perspective when you're listening to all these teachings. And so then you can go to Genesis and understand how the world was created, you know, and Adam and Eve, and then how the world fell, and then Noah, and get those stories of Moses and Abraham, you know, and then find out, through Ruth, the love of God, you know, and then Samuel, the prophet coming, and David, and then Solomon, and then the fall of the, the kings, and, and, and so forth. And you get an overview of everything, and it really helps you to understand the world today. If you don't understand what I'm talking about as far as the culture and a Christian having a worldview, not a Christian worldview, it could be because you're not in the Word of God, and it doesn't make any sense to you. And in a sense, we have blinders on our eyes. And it's foreign to us. And I think that's how they were because they cry out, like, what's going on? Why am I going through this? Uh, well, if you open your eyes, you, you'll see why they're going through it. So we see in the remaining verses their cry, confession, and their prayer uh, for the people. Look at verse 12 as they cry out. Is, is it nothing to you? All you who pass by, behold and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which has been brought on me, which the Lord has inflicted in the day of his fierce anger. Uh, I like that first statement there. Is it nothing to you? All you who pass by, they pass by Jerusalem, they pass by the temple, they, they see the destruction and the ruins, but it's nothing to them. Big deal. Like a lot of Americans, you know, Oh yeah, so what? They're killing Christians. Big deal. We're okay over here. You know, nothing's happening to us. You know, well, it will be if we don't wake up. And oftentimes we just push things away so that we don't hear about it. We don't need to watch it. And so if it's out of, out of sight, out of mind type of mentality, and we don't have to think about it. And, and these people are just walking by, but yet there's no compassion. There's no love for them whatsoever in this affliction. This reminds us of that cry of Jesus um, over Jerusalem because of their stiff-necked rejection of him in Matthew twenty-three thirty-seven. Old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to her. How often uh, I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You know, it, it's interesting how how people always. You know, blame the messenger you know, when they're not hearing the message. Let's just blame the messenger. It's his fault. And they crucified him. Yet he had such a love for them, didn't he? And they couldn't see it. Isn't it amazing how when you're trying to reveal truth to someone that they immediately crucify you as the messenger instead of seeing your heart, instead of seeing the truth that's there and receiving that truth to grow thereby. Only if you do that. I thank God that, that he had opened my eyes you know, when he revealed to me that I was a sinner and that I didn't get mad at him and, and say, you know, well, who are you to tell me that I'm a sinner? You know, who are you to judge me on those issues? You know, you're nobody. I used to say that to people, but when God faces you face to face, boy, you, you're humbled. And, and I agreed, I was, and I needed a Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us not be so rebellious and hard hearted to God or open to his truth. Verse 13, from above he has sent fire into my bones and it overpowers them. He has spread a net for me, for my feet and turned me back. He has made me desolate and faint all day. The yoke of my transgressions was bound. They were woven together by his hands and thrust upon my neck. He made my strength fail. The Lord delivered me into the hands of those who I am not able 
to withstand, like speaking of Babylon there, um, they literally were taken by their nose through rings and to captivity. They really couldn't do a thing about it. The Lord had trampled underfoot all my mighty men in my midst. He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord trampled as in a winepress the virgin daughters of Judah. For these things I weep. My eyes, my eyes overflow with water because the comforter who should restore my life as far as from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. Zion spreads out her hands, but no one comforts her. The Lord has commanded concerning Jacob that those abound around him become his adversaries. Jerusalem has become an unclean thing among them. So there's their cry out to the Lord. They view their enemies. They see them coming. They have no power to resist them. They're taken into captivity. Uh, People are walking by with no compassion, no love, no concern uh, about them whatsoever. By the way, God is concerned. God does weep. God does care what you're going through. He wants to be your God. He doesn't want you to go to anybody else but him. He is a jealous God and he loves you that much that he'll allow you to go through things until you come and sit at his feet so that he can deliver you and that you will know that he does deliver, that he does help and he's your help in time of need. And and when you see that, it deepens your relationship with God. He is waiting for you to do that. Those that are in pain. So they confess, verse 18 through 19, the Lord is righteous. Uh, That's a good way to start your confession. Lord, you're right. (laughs) Right on, Lord. Uh, You're right. I am wrong. Too many times we think we're right and everybody else is wrong. We need to humble ourselves and say, Lord, you are right in what you have said in your word, and I am wrong. For I rebelled against his commandment. Hear now, all people, and behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men have gone into captivity. I called for my lover, but they deceived me. My priests and my elders breathed their last in the city because they all were slaughtered while they sought food. They were starving to restore their lives because of all this. And why? Because they rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. The commandment of the Lord. Oftentimes... More than often, it is because of our choices, because our rebelliousness against God and not following his commandments. There, there is a measuring rod by which we can measure our relationship with God. First John speaks about it. He says it several times. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's a tough one. You know, when I first read that, I'm thinking, okay, so if I love God, I keep his commandments. So if I don't keep his commandments, I don't love God, but I thought I love God. I think I love God. How do I know if I love God? Because you keep my commandments. That's how you know. So it's, it's a measuring rod. So does it mean I don't love God if I don't keep him? Yes, that's what it's saying. It means you love him less. And you don't, you don't love him as much as you think you love him. Now, Our salvation and our relationship is not based upon our love for him or our faithfulness to him. It's based upon what? His love and his faithfulness for us. It really is because I find that I don't love him as much as I think I love him. Oh, my heart loves him and I'll say it all day long that I love him, but there are times where I don't follow his commandments and then I get into trouble and I reap what I sow and then I come to him and say, I should have followed your commandments. You know, forgive me, help me. Because you were right and I was wrong. And I make, need to make the right choices. That's our choice. He gives us that free will. Because he wants us to love him freely. Of our own hearts. And yet they did not. But at least they repented. And then they prayed in verse 20. See, O Lord, that I am in distress. My soul is troubled. My heart is overturned within me. For I have been very rebellious. Again, acknowledging the rebelliousness outside uh, the sword bereaves at home it is like death they have heard that i sigh but no one comforts me all my enemies have heard of my trouble they are glad that you have done it bring on the day you have announced that they 
may become like me. So there was a promise there given by God that he would only allow them to be there in captivity for how long? 70 years? And then he would deliver them from that captivity. And so they're at the point where they're now, okay, Lord, you've promised us this. Yes, we agree. We have been rebellious. We have sinned against you. And our enemies are prospering. But would you bring them as we are? And would you bless us as you have promised? Uh, they knew his promise, just as we know God's promise. And he goes on and said, let all, the, let all their wickedness come before you and do to them as you have done to me for all my transgressions, for my sighs are many and my heart is faint. So Judah there prays that God will repay the wickedness of, the, of those enemies that are gloating over, over them while admitting their their transgression. And then we come to chapter 2. We see the effects of, of God's wrath here in verses 1 through 13. Uh, the Lord is seen as being the one to punish Jerusalem or chastise Jerusalem to bring them back into a relationship uh, with God. Hebrews tells us that, that God corrects us or chastises us because he loves us. Though we don't like chastisement, it is important that we understand it's, it's done because God loves us. Uh, if he didn't love us, he wouldn't chastise us or correct us from our wrongs. And so because he loves us, he corrects us. I don't think there's any, any child that likes correction. I don't remember ever liking correction when I was a child. I used to hate it. In fact, I used to think, because you're spanking me or telling me I can't do this, it's because you don't love me. You don't care about me. And what a lie of the enemy, huh? Even as funny as that is for us as adults, yet that's how a child thinks. Because they're being punished for something that they truly don't understand, the harm that will come of it. And then here we grow up, and we make the same choices and we're telling God, why are you punishing me? We don't like this. But yet it's for our good because he loves us. I'd rather God punish me and put me through things that I may know that he loves me than to just let me go. That's, that's one of the philosophies in the world, isn't it? In disciplining our children. Just let them grow up to be what, what they want to be. Leave them alone. Don't put any limits on them. Don't, don't put any boundaries. You know, just let them express themselves and so forth. Boy, if, if you do that, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. If you allow your kids to just express themselves and to grow in the direction that they want to go and never correct them and never chastise them, never tell them that they're wrong and so forth, you know what they're going to do? They're going to do what comes natural. Sin. And then it's going to destroy them. Believe me. A generation that has no moral guidance or values, the next generation will take the same steps. If you have a generation that um, dives into their pleasures and then they have children and they allow them to dive into their pleasures, you just... Keep that generations going after generation after generation after generation. I've seen families who have lived ungodly and their children live ungodly with a phallus mouth, uh, with unwed marriage and relationships with children and so forth. Yeah. We need to be careful that we don't just let kids. We need to discipline them. We need to guide them. We need to lead them because we love them, the Bible says. And as parents, that's important. So we see here in the first 13 verses, you'll notice a, a phrase or, or, or a thought being used um, over and over again, uh, how the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud of his anger, or in his anger. He has cast down uh, heaven to the earth, the beauty of Israel, and did not remember his footstool in the days of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up and has pitied all the dwelling places of Jacob. He has thrown down in his wrath the stronghold of the daughter of Judah. He has brought them down to the ground. He has profaned the kingdom and its princes. He has cut off the fierce anger uh, every horn of Israel. He has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. He has blazed against Jacob uh, like a flame, flaming fire devouring all around uh, sounding like an enemy, he has bent his bow. 
with his right hand like an adversary. He has slain all who were pleasing to his eyes. On the tent of the daughters of Zion, he has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord was like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her places. He has destroyed her stronghold. He I wanted to put he in there. And has increased mourning and limitation in the daughter of Judah. He has done violence uh, to his tabernacle as if it were a garden. He has destroyed uh, his place of assembly. The Lord has caused the appointed feast and Sabbath to be forgotten in Zion. In his burning indignation, he has spun the king and the priest the Lord has spun his altar. He has abandoned his sanctuary. He has given up the walls of her places into the hands of the enemy. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as on the day of a set feast. The Lord has purposed to destroy the walls of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched out a line. He has not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore, he has caused the rampart and wall to lament. They languish together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has destroyed the broken. Uh, Her bars, her king, and her prince are among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughters of Zion sit on the ground and keep silent. They throw dust on their head and gird themselves with sackcloth. The virgins of Jerusalem bow their heads to the ground. So in shame because of what God has been doing to them. My eyes failed with tears. My heart is troubled. My anger of Baal is poured on the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. Because the children and the infants faint in the streets of the city. Uh, So he gets a little descriptive here. And he talks about the children being affected uh, by the parents' sins here. Because of their choices, then the children are suffering and they're in the streets laying there. Uh, They say to their mothers, uh, where is grain and wine? As they swoon like the wounded in the streets of the city. As their life is poured out in their mother's bosom. They were having miscarriages. How shall I console you? To what shall I liken you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I compare you with? That I may come for you, O virgin daughter of Zion. For your ruin is spread wide as the sea. Who can heal you? And of course, the only person that can is Christ himself. Only Jesus can take care of our problems. Only Jesus can take over our situations if we come to him humbly. He warns the false prophets and the people in verse 14. Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not uncovered your iniquity to bring back your captivity, but have envisioned for you false prophecies and delusions. Now this verse ought to be taken and mailed to Joel Osteen. (laughs) Because what he's saying here is, The prophets, your teachers, your priests, they prophesied wrong. They prophesied deceptive visions. They've not taken off, in a sense, their their veil and revealed the iniquity in your life. They only say good things. Oh, God loves you, and God's in control, and He has a work and a, a good thing coming. It's not your fault. You haven't done anything wrong whatsoever. God is working on the enemy. God is reaching the world through you, you know, and so forth. And just speaking about the positive, but never speaking the truth. And the truth is, is it was their sins that put them in that place. It was their iniquities that caused them to be in that place. But their false prophets, their teachers, were lying to them, saying everything's okay. God is going to do a great work and a deliverance. There are so many that do that, like Joel Osteen and others. Now, I'm all for positive. I don't want to think negative too much either. I want to be positive in the right things. I want to make sure that I'm real with God. 
that God can deliver us from everything, that God can help us through our situations, that God can restore us and God can forgive us. Those are all positive things. Uh, But if we never talk about sin, if we never talk about our faults, if we never talk about the result of sin, which is death and destruction, we don't talk about the works of the flesh, we don't talk about the fact that we're not to be idol worshipers, you know, and so forth, then we're going to continue to fall into the same traps. We have to have a balanced uh, view of our lives and the world's life and through scriptures. And that is sin and yet forgiveness. Grace, and yet there's evil in the world, you know, and good choices, and yet we make bad choices and so forth. We need to understand that, and we need to be careful that we're not always listening to a positive message. It's interesting, I was uh, looking at somebody's uh, Facebook, and they uh, posted something on there about anger. And it was pretty much to the point was, do not allow anger, do not allow others to turn you into something uh, through your anger. So in other words, people shouldn't control you and make you angry, you know, and so forth. And so I thought about that because I've been dealing with anger and studying it lately. Um, I just thought about Jesus. So what are you saying, that the money changers really affected Jesus, that he couldn't control himself? No, that's not true. That was a righteous anger And so they were saying we shouldn't get angry. Well, I think we should at times. I think we should be angry that these children are are dying and being beheaded. If you're not angry, then you bought the lie. There's no emotion or compassion or love in you whatsoever for children. We should be angry that that you can put all the, the wars in the world together and yet the amount of people that have died is less than the abortions that have been committed in the United States. We should be angry at that. Because these are innocent lives that are being aborted every single day. Uh, there's a site that will actually keep track of abortion uh, per hour, per day, per year. And it's just amazing. You watch the ticker on it, it's just tink, 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 ticking every day. One, another one, another one, another one. Another one. Just constantly, 24 hours just going. Another abortion, another death, another child, another girl, another boy, little one, granddaughter, 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 grandson, little child, little child. Just over and over you think, Lord, how much longer can we continue to do this? And yet we don't fight it. Yeah. There's more said about Robin Williams right now than these children that are being beheaded or than abortion, even by Christians. That says something about us. It says something very interesting, is that our priorities are wrong. They really are wrong. But yet, we're in the United States. We're safe. Hey, we're okay. We got a job. We're eating. We got a car. We got a house. You know, we're we're okay, you know, type of thing. You know, and it's sad that we think that way. We need to have that balance. Verse 15. <clears throat> the onlookers, you know, there's always onlookers that are looking at uh, what's going on, and it seems like the United States is an onlooker. All who pass uh, by clap their hands at you. They, they hiss and shake their heads at the daughters of Jerusalem. Is this the city that is called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? Now, if you go to Jerusalem, you'll understand this completely the perfection of beauty. I mean, there's just something about it. You know, they say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, right? You know what that means, right? S- somebody can look at someone and they're beautiful. Someone else can look at that same person and go, okay, I don't know, see what you see in them. <laughs> you know, say they're not as beautiful as you think they are, but they are to that person. There's something about Jerusalem when you go there that God's divine spirit just gives you this, this view of Jerusalem as beautiful. It's perfection. It's amazing. Uh, because everywhere you, you, you stand, there's history. Uh, there's the children of Israel and what God has done in the history of Israel in that area there. Is just, it's just an awesome place to be. And, and you can look at Jerusalem as a, a perfect, beautiful creation of the Lord. It just brings joy to your heart to be there. Even in, in the darkest places, when we were down in what they called the, the old city, which is the old Jerusalem that's walled in, there's different quarters 
uh, you have the Jewish quarter, the Armenian quarter, and then you have the Muslim quarter and so forth. And we had uh, another guy and myself, we, we decided we were going to take a walk in, at night, which we shouldn't have done. And we started going down the different uh, quarters. Now, it's a maze in there. And unless you know what you're doing and how to get out, I wouldn't recommend it. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to get out. Because literally a maze. It literally is. Uh, if you look at the the topical view of a maze, you know how you can see all the little lines and sometimes there's a dead end? That's how it is in the city of Jerusalem. We literally walk down thinking we're going to go out and all of a sudden it's a dead end. There's a door to someone's house. And you're like, okay, so we got to turn back and take another left or a right and hopefully we just kept doing that. Next thing we know, we're in the Muslim quarter and it's dark and it's just amazing how scary it looks but yet at the same time, there, there, there's this sense that, that God was there because this is his place, this is his home, this is Jerusalem, Zion, you know, that God had established. And thank be to God that all of a sudden we saw a bunch of Israelite soldiers, you know, all standing around. And so we went over to them and said, hey, where's the gate? And they go, oh, just right over there. And I'm like, Phew, and got out through the gate, got a taxi and went home. Could have been killed, you know, that, that quick and easy. But it is a beautiful place to visit. All your enemies have opened their mouth against you. That speaks of Israel, doesn't it? Just today, it's like nobody likes Israel. They're all against it. They hiss. They gnash their teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Surely this is the day we have waited for. We have found it. We have seen it. You know, Judah's neighbors are gloating over the fact that Jerusalem has been destroyed. Uh, they clap their hands, they hiss, they say uh, all kinds of wicked things about them, just like they do today. And their hope is, is that Israel will be destroyed again. Look at what Hamas has done, you know, shooting rockets over there constantly. And yet God has intervened. I was just reading a story how they were shooting some rockets and they shot these rockets that were going into a, a building that had probably about 5,000 people or so. And so they, they started to shoot off their missiles to intercept it. And the first missile missed. It didn't intercept it. And then the second missile missed. And so they're going, oh no. So he kind of like, kind of bared himself to this blast. Well, all of a sudden he said a wind came. And the wind was so strong that it literally pushed the missile into the ocean. And it blew up in the ocean. And God is watching over his people. The timing is not yet. You know. And yet these people want to destroy them. Look at the tunnels that they built underneath this, the, the cities just to get to them, that they're able to just come out of the ground, grab someone, and boom, and they're gone. You'll never see them again. Uh, that's how they believe some of the soldiers have been kidnapped and so forth. Uh, these people want to kill Israel. Isa, if they were closer and they had the opportunity, would probably be over there doing wicked things to Israel. Look at what Hitler did to Israel starving them until they were just bones and skin. You see the pictures and you go, how can someone do that? How can someone do that to another human being? Because their view of them was satanic. They didn't view them as human beings. They viewed them as animals, you know, as nothing. I, I were, read one post by a Muslim guy. They were talking about Israel and how we need to pray for them. And this guy says, they, Israel has killed our children. They're nothing. They deserve what they get. And then all these posts come in. What are you talking about? If you just stopped firing, no kids would die. If you just stopped putting kids in schools, they wouldn't die. No, Israel's at fault. You know? And it's like you see the blinders upon their eyes. They have such a hatred for Israel and such a hatred for Christians. And I think the hatred for Christians is going to increase, unfortunately. It's going to increase even more and more, especially with our administration. There's a hatred for believing Christians. You have these two fights going on in the world today and they rejoice in the fact that they can kill their enemies. I don't know if you've seen that one post that I, I put with this, this jihadist individual. He's got his curly hair and he's just smiling away. And he's got a little girl in his, in his arms there and, and she's terrified. Her, her face, you can just see the terror in her face because I'm sure that they're going to behead her. Um, and and they're, they're happy about it. They think they're doing a service to God. Just crazy stuff. I don't understand it. 
And God truly needs to come and, and take care of this. And then we see the fulfillment of God's warning here in verse 17. The Lord has done what he's purposed. He has fulfilled his word which he commanded in the days of old. He has thrown down and has not pitied. And he has caused an enemy to rejoice over you. He has exalted the horn of your adversary. So just as he promised, God keeps his promises. So there's a call to repentance. Their heart cries out to the Lord, O wall of daughters of Jerusalem, or Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no grief. Give your eyes no rest. Arise, cry out. In the night, at the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands towards him for the life of your young children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. See, O Lord, and consider, to whom have you done this? Just the plea to God in the fact that we're your children Look what you have done to us, your children, whom you've called through Abraham and the promises. Reconsider this. Should the women eat their offspring? It was so bad that the women were literally eating the babies. I don't even want to get into that. The children, they have cuddled their preemies preemie births that are taking place because of miscarriages and so forth. Should the priests and the prophets be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? Another picture of leadership being destroyed. The enemy loves that when you destroy leadership, when you destroy the credibility of leadership, when you attack the leadership, when there's no respect for leadership and so forth. You know, the enemy will always start at leadership because if you can slay the shepherd, then the sheep will scatter. If you can destroy a shepherd in the church, then the sheep will be destroyed also. We've seen that over and over in various ministries where the enemy has come in, and yet there's no regard for authority. Yet young and old lie on the ground in the streets. My virgins and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have slain them in the day of your anger you have slaughtered and not pitied you have invited as to a feast day the terrors that surround me in the days of your anger there was no refuge or survivor those whom i have bore and brought up my enemies have destroyed so the streets were basically filled with all those that were slain because God had invited the Babylonians to come and feast, in a sense, upon his people. 